So if you uh, join me, uh, we pray as we live in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, grant us God, um, Lord of all, a vision for the world as you see it, a vision for the world that pours out your love, a world where, we, where the weak are protected and none go hungry, where none experience poverty, where the riches of creation are shared and everyone can enjoy them, where a world of races and cultures live in harmony and mutual respect and understanding, a world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. Give us the inspiration today and through our conversation and through our sharing, the courage to build this kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mike, how are you, my man? Well, uh, first off, uh, thank you so much for taking some an hour out of your summer. Uh, I know that many of you have been working nonstop uh, despite my busting up Kevin's chops um, to support your schools and whatever they plan on doing um, as you continue to figure that out and nothing is, as we know, uh, set in stone and it seems to be changing uh, every hour of every day. Um, but this, uh, this gathering today really came out of conversations that we had at our weekly check-ins throughout the spring and early summer. Um, as many of you were discussing some concerns of how do we fulfill our mission as is a very brothers sponsored school when our service programs, at least how they've traditionally been done, uh, won't, would not be able to encounter those um, and work through um, encountering those experiencing poverty and, and working with those on the margins directly due to our schools, uh, social distancing guidelines and so forth. And many of the conversations there kind of pivoted to, you know, is this a time for us to look at social justice and advocacy work um, as a complement to our service programs in an effort to, uh, to introduce something new and still maintain our mission. Um, and after working with some colleagues in the Jesuit Schools Network, um, I reached out to, uh, to two organizations that are actually under the same umbrella now, um, Education for Justice, which I know is a resource that our network has used in the past um, for uh, a lot of uh, prayers and classroom materials and things like that. And as well as the Nation Solidarity Network, which to my understanding has has taken over Education for Justice and kind of assumed that into its uh, organization, which is a really terrific uh, work that has traditionally worked within Jesuit which, with Jesuit institutions at the high school and college level and parishes and so forth to help them understand uh, their call to social justice uh, within that unique charism. Uh, and having done work with both those organizations in the past, I reached out. I was able to connect with uh, Aaron Brown, who's of the Nation Solidarity Network, and Brennan Davis, who's technically of Education for Justice, and to have some conversations with them, just asking, hey, how are you supporting other Catholic schools and other Jesuit schools uh, and understanding advocacy work in this challenging time? Um, and would they would be willing to have a conversation with our network? One, I think twofold, right? So I think it's for us to begin to imagine and understand new ways of engaging our call to social justice through advocacy, something that I think some of our schools have uh, lightly touched upon. Um, and I think that they, they'll have some great resources for us, but also to introduce you to organizations where I, I think their uh, programming and resources are, are really top notch. Uh, having brought students and faculty to several uh, of, their, uh, of their programs, um, they're often the highlights of the year for a sort of outside program that we'd go to. Um, so I, I can't speak highly enough, and I want to introduce uh, them to you so that you can understand their networks and their organizations a little bit better. Um, but also, let's have some time here to really focus on learning a little bit more about uh, digital advocacy in our, in our Catholic tradition and, and how we can engage that through mission. So with that, I'll uh, turn that over to uh, Brenna and Aaron uh, to speak a little bit more and to uh, begin our presentation, and then we'll have time for questions towards the end. Thanks so much. We're really happy to, to be here with you today and to be able to share a little bit about um, our work. Um, as Ben said, my name is Erin Brown. I'm Program Director at the Ignatian Solidarity Network. And I'll let Brenna introduce herself as well. Yes, and so uh, I'm Brenna, um, and I also work at ISN, um, and Education for Justice is a piece of my work. So I'm the Director of Education for Justice, and then I also lead all of our environmental programming at the Ignatian Solidarity Network. 
Um, and we have uh, a presentation. So if it's okay, Ben, I'm gonna share my screen. Yep, go for it. Um, and can everyone see the ISN logo? Excellent. Um, so for those of you who may be new um, to ISN's work, or perhaps some of you have had some touch points, for example, um, the Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice is a way into our work for a lot of people. Um, ISN is a national organization that is committed to networking, educating, and forming advocates for social justice. Um, a lot of our work is with um, secondary higher ed um, institutions, um, as well as with some parishes um, as well. We're rooted um, in the spiritual tradition of St. Ignatius of Loyola um, and the legacy of the Jesuit martyrs of El Salvador. Um, however, we're a lay-led organization, so we're not um, technically a ministry um, of the Jesuits. However, we do a lot of collaboration um, with Jesuit institutions. Um, and however, we use, we use the term Ignatian family or Ignatian network often, and we mean it to be a very expansive term. Um, that includes institutions who may not be Jesuit, but who are also rooted in um, faith that does justice um, and in Ignatian spirituality. Um, so a few of our focus areas, our issue areas, um, are ecological justice, migration, racial justice, um, and economic justice. Um, so I'll let uh, Brenna, take it from here and tell you a little bit about our approach and the Ignatian lens we use um, in our advocacy work. Thanks, Erin. Um, and if at any point anybody has any questions or for some reason my internet cuts out, just feel free to unmute yourself and um, let me know. Um, so in preparing for this conversation, um, Ben actually gave me this really uh, wonderful guide, the Partners in Mission, um, about the uh, Xaverian Way. And that was a really uh, interesting insight into kind of the, the work that, that you all do and what grounds your mission. And so I think that just to start out, um, this quote was from the document. Um, and I think that at this moment, there are a lot of challenging things happening in the world. And like I said, I'm a former classroom teacher and like the thought of trying to plan for a digital or in person or mixed year um, gives me anxiety and I'm not having to do that. Um, but I do hope that as we have this conversation that you will really think about this challenge as an opportunity um, to really go deeper into into your tradition and into Catholic identity um, and into work for for faith and, and justice. And so I, I see a lot of overlap between um, the Xaverian mission and, um, and the Ignatian kind of charism and spirituality. Um, and so uh, something that I really appreciated was uh, especially from your calls, uh, the call to the spirituality um, and noticing God's presence in the common, ordinary, unspectacular flow of everyday life. Um, I think that you all really like that calls it like it is like in Ignatian tradition, we talk a lot about God in all things, but I think that like we are really living this unspectacular and common flow, right, of, of, of living in quarantine, um, of digital learning. And, and so I, I uh, just really appreciate how you, you put those qualifiers on there. And students are going to be feeling this, right? And you're going to be feeling this, like digital um, learning is really hard and it's a grind if that's part of what you're planning on doing. Um, and you're definitely going to need humility and zeal to kind of make it through. Um, and so I think that this is just a really uh, great time to kind of uh, tap into that part of our, of our shared tradition as we think about um, digital advocacy. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about how we uh, see justice um, and work for justice through the Ignatian lens. Um, that is my boss's uh, photoshopping, not mine, but I really love it. Um, and, and to really think about how this is rooted in the Bible, right? So we have the works of mercy, right, in Matthew 25. And I think that that's where a lot of um, service and justice starts in, in our schools, in Jesuit schools, in Zavarian schools, um, is, is how do we go out and, and meet people where they are and provide for their um, immediate needs. Um, but I think that 
there is also this other part of the call, right, that is, uh, that is found in the Beatitudes and this hunger and thirst for righteousness that is uh, a, a deep part of our Catholic identity and tradition. Um, and this, this hunger and thirst uh, for righteousness, it, it's, it takes a lot longer, right? Uh, but it's a part of the call. And so sometimes we don't get to see the fruits of our efforts, um, but it's definitely um, kind of two sides of the same coin of, of how we're called to, to work for justice in the world. Um, and so I wanted to share a story with you and many of you may already know this, but I do think it's maybe a good reminder um, as we're trying to frame things to students in this upcoming year um, about the importance of, of the works of, of mercy, but also that kind of longer term view of advocating for justice. Um, so this is the, the babies in the river story, um, if you're familiar. And so I just invite you now to imagine that you live next to a lovely river Right, you're just hanging out there, enjoying your summer break, not thinking about lesson planning or, or digital learning. Um, and then all of a sudden, right, uh, you see uh, a baby is floating down the river, right? And it's saying, help me, help me. And so you're all kind, loving people. So, uh, you know, if you know how to swim, if you have that skill set, I'm sure you're gonna jump in and, and grab the baby and help the baby out of, of the water, right? Well, you do that and you kind of go into action mode. You, you get the baby back to town. You make sure it's okay. You feed it. You, you know, you're, you're doing everything you can for the baby. Um, but then the next day, right, three more babies are coming down the river. And so now you're like, oh my goodness, right? Like this is, this is a little bit overwhelming, um, but you, you jump into action and, and you care for all of those babies uh, as well, right? And so then, right, we're really good at jumping into action. So we say, there are babies floating down the river. So we're gonna have a 24 hour watchtower so that we can know whenever the babies are coming down, right? And then back in town, people have set up a nursery for the babies so that they have a place where they can be safe and where they can you know, sleep and eat and grow. Um, then we have people who are really excited about gathering whatever supplies the babies need. They're willing to go out and buy diapers and food and, and you know, lotion, and I don't have any babies, but all of the things that babies need, right, to, to live their baby lives. And then maybe we have somebody who's really excited about um, setting up like a preschool for the babies and kind of giving them the beginning of their education. And somebody else is jumping in and giving us new nets so that we can um, go and and get the babies out of the river. And we're getting most of the babies, but some of them are still slipping through, but we have like a pretty good percentage uh, going with the babies. And then we go to mass on Sunday, post pandemic, and the priest is blessing us and saying, you're doing such good work. Like, thank you for caring for, for all of these babies, right? And so this is something that we're really good in the church. We're really good at, at meeting kind of the immediate needs of, of what we're seeing, right? But then finally, uh, one day, you know, it's the flow is kind of overwhelming. And so finally, one day, somebody says, you know, where are all of these babies coming from? Right? And so they say, I think, like, it's really important that we ha still have people on the watchtower, and we still have people feeding and clothing the babies and teaching the babies. But I think some of us should probably drive up river and see where these babies are, are coming from, right? And I think that the, the framework that we often use in the church, right, is the two feet of love in action, right? So we have our charitable works, um, how we're meeting the individual and basic needs. Um, but we also have to invite students to really examine the root causes of, of why things are happening. Um, you know, so I know in my experience, I really appreciated going to, um, grew up in Tennessee and we had a food pantry and I went there and I met people experiencing homelessness and that then got me asking questions about, well, why is this happening? And is there anything that we can do um, so that nobody has to experience homelessness, right? And so asking, you know, what's happening upriver is really the beginning of advocacy for, for us and, and for our students. Um, so I'm just going to, that's just obviously a little bit of the background and maybe something that you might want to share um, with students, but, um, you know, advocacy can happen in a lot of different ways. So I'm just going to briefly talk about kind of the variety of ways that you can advocate. I think the kind of most common um, way that people know about is legislative advocacy. So, you know, 
talking with your students about a justice issue and then reaching out to someone who has some political power and having a conversation about kind of policy that you would like to see changed. Um, but there's also, you know, corporate advocacy, you know, like we, we vote with our pocketbooks or with our wallets, right? Um, and also like educational advocacy. Um, so ISN I think is best known for our legislative advocacy, um, but I think that this chart um, is really helpful in just kind of helping us to think outside of the box, right? Um, so we really have to think about who is our audience. So, you know, with students, are we trying to do some advocacy on campus about the environment or about racial justice, right? Um, and if we are, and if our goal is awareness, then, you know, public education is probably going to be the way that we want to lead our advocacy campaign. We have to let people know what's going on um, versus kind of the other end of the spectrum is uh, maybe we just want to go directly to the decision makers, right? And we want to talk to um, the people in power, uh, speak truth to power um, in response to the signs of the times, right? And so, we might want to do some awareness with a policymaker. So, you know, this is my story that I'm going to share. Um, and we have a coworker, Jose, and he um, has DACA right now. And he has gone many times to share his story about being a DACA recipient with policymakers, um, just to kind of give them a little bit of a human face and some insight into what is going on, um, all the way up to litigation, right? And, and you know, like, suing the government, right, is, is also a form of, of advocacy. Um, so I think that there are a lot of places in between the two, and you can be really creative about how, um, how we advocate with students and get them to think about it. This chart is the same thing, but it's just um, flipping it and thinking of it in terms of outcomes. So what outcome do we want with our action or, or service advocacy project, right? So um, do we want policy change? Do we want increased knowledge? Do we want to build a coalition of people um, who are supportive or maybe who aren't supportive and we want to get them on board with our issue, right? Um, do we want to just change attitudes and beliefs of people around a specific issue? That is a really important first step to then that will then could eventually lead to policy change, right? Um, so, I just wanted to say all of that because I think that immediately our minds definitely go to legislative advocacy um, when, when we're talking about, um, about things. So I, I'm just gonna, and you'll have access to this um, presentation. I just invite you to think about like in your classes um, and in the courses you teach or in your departments where you work, like what are you about? What is your mission? What is your vision? What are your goals? Um, and kind of how can that help you to kind of figure out where would my talents, you know, uh, fit in to getting students really excited about advocacy, right? So you might not be a person who wants to go protest or who feels super comfortable going to a legislative office. So what are my gifts and how do they fit in with the vision um, and the mission of my class or the school or the Zavarian network? Um, and, and how can I move forward from there with students? Um, the next couple of slides are I just put in here because I think that they're also really helpful to uh, share with students when we're thinking about advocacy. Um, you have to really think about who's in power to make the change that I want to see. So I've just been really fascinated personally with the right to repair movement that's happening that basically is a movement to allow people to fix their electronics so I don't have to take my iPhone to Apple to get it repaired like I should have the ability to repair it myself. And that has really important environmental consequences on e-waste, right? And so, um, so who has the power to make that change? Who are our allies? Who can be brought on board? Um, are just important questions to get students thinking. Um, so, you know, if students are, and I would be interested to hear. I'm sorry for just kind of talking, talking, talking. Are there what are service projects that you all um, do on campus that students are really excited about or passionate about? Um, well, before the pandemic, we had juniors uh, volunteer uh, twice a week, uh, different juniors at a, a local soup kitchen. Okay. Uh, and they very much enjoyed that. Um, I don't know what we're going to do with the pandemic now, but 
Um, but that has been something we've been doing for a, a while. Uh, and that is something that many of them really, really enjoy. They all want to go back again. Okay. I, I like to think it's not because they want to get out of class, but. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. I'm yeah, sure it has it's nothing to do with that. Yeah. All about the quality of your service experience. Yeah. Anyone else? One of the things we do at St. X in Louisville is we run a burial program for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the COVID virus has been in place, we haven't been able to go to the cemetery. Um, and then we also do Project Warm where we insulate houses for the poor and the marginalized. Okay. Yeah, those are two very powerful and important services um, that you're doing with your students. And so I would invite you to think about, especially if you're working with the same students, like what experiences have they already had and what are they already excited about? So maybe if you can't do burials anymore, could you somehow plan a digital prayer service, right? That would maybe with photos of people who have been, um, who have passed recently um, with their names and invite people in the community to to take part in this really powerful experience that maybe only a small group of students were were a part of initially um, and then think about like how you can grow that program in the future in terms of of advocating like why are why don't these people you know have mm -hmm. the access to the service and to the burial and to, to ask those questions right and, I, it, one yeah. of the things that i've always been interested in but just didn't have time but maybe now we have time is to go back with the coroner's office and to talk to them about, um, you know, to find the mean age of those who have died. And uh, I'm sure there's issues of healthcare that they were not accessed, were able to get access to healthcare. And just there's a lot of justice issues that yeah. are why are these people needing to be buried in a uh, pauper cemetery? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that is exactly like this is a time we may not be able to go outward, but I think that we can go inward and deeper with our students. And so I think that those previous experiences that they've had of service are going to be a really important place to start as you think about, well, how can we still address this issue that our students care about deeply, but in, in newer ways, right? Um, Another thing to talk about with students, right, is this idea of the spectrum of allies, right? And so when you care about a justice issue, like homelessness, um, like racism, like the environment, you're going to have people who are like on board or not on board. And I think we see this a lot in our kind of uh, politicized, the politicized world that we live in, especially with the election coming up, right? So you're gonna have people who always actively oppose you. And then you're gonna have people who are kind of neutral and then people who are kind of passively supporting you. And so the idea of the spectrum of allies is to try to get people to move over one spot. Right. So if somebody is like actively protesting something that you're doing, maybe we can get them to become passive protesters. Right. Um, the, the real kind of richness of this happens when you get people who are neutral um, to passive support and also when you get passive support to active support. So when you engage people who are like, yeah, I, I care about homelessness or yeah, I think it's important to care about the environment, but I don't really do much about it when you're able to engage that group, right, then you kind of have this critical mass um, that can that can make kind of larger change. Um, so I also just put these discussion questions in here because I think that they are also questions that could be used with with students um, as you're trying to think about the justice issues that you want to work on and what that will look like in a digital landscape, right? So like who holds the power, who are allies, who like I work on environmental issues and like at my point in my career, I am not dealing with people who are climate deniers, right? Like that's not the best use of my energy. Um, so that's not where I'm gonna put it. I'm trying to get people who are kind of like neutral or passive to come on over um, and, and start to actively work on the issues. Um, in terms of legislative advocacy, because that is something that ISN does so well, I did want to share this resource. We have um, an Ignatian Advocacy 101 guide, and it can be found at the website at the bottom, igsol.net slash advocacy. Um, and it's just kind of a how-to guide of like, how do you plan a meeting? 
what what should we have in the meeting if we do decide to talk to the mayor or a local representative or a state representative right um, and the do's and don'ts um some of it won't apply we haven't updated it for digital advocacy but there are um, offices that are taking zoom conversations with people um, so i think it is still possible to set up office visits um, if there is a justice issue that you are particularly excited to get students to engage on um, and to talk to a representative. I have a few, I, there are many ideas for how to do advocacy in a digital landscape and Erin and I are gonna share specific programs that ISN has going on. These are just a few that came up, right? So if you're really into education and dialogue, you could encourage students to have family members watch the movie 13th right and then have a zoom discussion with other family members right so like especially as we're talking about racial justice um you know there's a call for white people to be having the really hard conversations with other white people um and so i don't know the demographics of your student bodies right but i think getting people to engage in conversations around racial justice with their family members could be a very radical act right for for some people that could lead to education and possible kind of further action from there um, if you are interested in more of the legislative side of things uh, you could try to set up a class zoom meeting with a state or federal office um, a lot of times the offices kind of have limited capacity so in this digital landscape it is kind of exciting to think about the fact that your whole class could zoom into this meeting um, and ask this representative or a staffer questions about their immigration policy, about their environmental policy, or about their racial justice policy, um, and have kind of this real world meeting in a way that it might not have been possible, especially if you have like multiple sections of students and you know the school schedule um, it varies by school, but um, that could be an interesting uh, way to do things. Another thing could be like a digital voter registration um, via TikTok possibly. I don't know how schools feel about um, that app specifically. I know there are some issues, but we do know that students are using it a, a lot. So, you know, especially with your seniors, some of them who might be old enough to vote in this, uh, this year's election, how do we get them to politically engage um, from the beginning, right? The, the sky is the limit on this. Um, and so, um, I just encourage you to, again, lead with what excites you and what you think will excite your students because um, unfortunately there is so much injustice in the world that everyone's gifts and talents are needed in every possible way that we can, we can share them um, on the advocacy and justice front. Um, I just put this quote here again because I think that idea of the gritty reality or the common ordinary everyday flow of life like how do we um, how do we follow God's will with in that in that context um, and I think that giving students ways to critically engage with justice issues um, is is really important so like you said ben right like some students might be asking questions of why are these funerals happening why are these people experiencing homelessness and being buried in this field instead of a cemetery you know like family members um, and so how do we help them to go up the river how do we accompany them up the river um, to ask the the important questions that we really want our students to do one of your calls is about active and engaged and critical thinkers um, in terms of of learners and so uh, advocacy is a really um, important way uh, that we can access that um, kind of coming to a little bit of a close on this i think that um the pope francis talks a lot about the culture of encounter and i think that that's really important um, and it is going to be complex to make that happen in this digital landscape and but i invite you to think creatively about how you can still do that so would a prayer service with the pictures of all of the people that have been buried through your program ben um, could that be a way for students to encounter and experience um, homelessness um, in this digital landscape it's not an in-person interaction but is that possible are there ways that you can zoom people into your classrooms um, who are who are having these experiences or use webinars with people's direct stories i know it's a little bit harder on the screen versus having that personal interaction 
Um, but I, I do think that that we need to be creative about this. There's also a, a lot of letters to the elderly program. Could you get a pen pal and have students kind of talk to someone who is elderly and doesn't have a lot of um, outlets because of COVID and develop a friendship in that way. And then think a little bit more critically about elder care and why do we have so many um, people who are kind of approaching the end of life alone um, and isolated. Um, Another group that we had talked to said that they're doing English les lessons on Zoom. So for people who need to learn English, um, there you could try to partner with a local organization and just, you know, even if you don't think your students know English that well, just having a conversation partner um, via Zoom could be a really interesting way to share stories and kind of begin an encounter piece digitally. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many ideas. The sky is the limit again. Um, this is the pastoral circle. It's sometimes called the Ignatian pedagogical paradigm. There's like a million names for it. Um, but basically, right, we have to start with experience. And that is what we are usually doing in our service programs is we're giving the students the experience. Um, but what we're asking with advocacy is to move around the wheel and do the analysis to ask why are people having this experience? Um, and then to do some prayerful reflection in light of the scriptures. What does our faith call us to do? How are we called to respond as Catholics to this injustice? And then finally, the action and evaluation piece is the advocacy. Okay, so I've, I've met this person. I've had this experience. This is um, the reason that I believe it's happening. Let me pray on this and discern how am I called to act? How am I called to use my talents and gifts? I think that that is also another piece of your calls that I really appreciated, this idea that, um, that each individual has these very unique gifts to share. Um, and since we are in this new and weird time, how can we encourage students to kind of express them, um, especially if we are stuck in this kind of like two-dimensional um, digital landscape? Um, you know, for we love Greg Boyle in the Ignatian world. I think a lot of people do. Um, and the goal of, of advocacy is, is the same as the goal of service, right? That there is no separation, that there is us, that everyone um, is, is protected by the same laws is, and can live a, a fulfilled life because you know the people that we serve are also intelligent people with goals and dreams and joys. Um, and so, so we want to make a world in which they get to express those just like we do. Um, so that is kind of the end of kind of just the advocacy overview. Um, and then Aaron and I are just gonna share some specific resources that ISN um, would is happy to provide um, to folks. Um, don't know if there are any questions or Ben, should we just wait for questions at the end? I think if there are some questions now, we can break it up. Break it up a little bit. You know, one of the questions I would have is, um, Sanex does a wonderful job with service, and and I, you know, the I'm really in awe of the students, and and they do have good hearts. Um, a lot of them, though, come from a background that's uh, when you get to the justice aspect of life. There's, you know, I see it in the classroom where there's a lot of resistance. Um, in some ways, I encounter a lot of. Uh, white male victimization that uh, were the victims and um, and it's so endemic in our culture right now and you know it's the easy part really has been the service um, the, the great challenge I see is how do you take an affluent group of really good young men and help to open their eyes up to systemic uh, injustice and how are we a part of that continuation of the injustice because you begin to ask questions about my own background, what I own, uh, my place in it. And um, it, it, it's just climbing a mountain, it really is. Yeah, and I, that's, I mean, in, in many ways, uh, most Jesuit schools are the exact same demographic, right? Um, 
a lot, it's a lot of all male schools that are affluent. Um, but I think even just you, have you just asked those questions or have you like, I mean, I think we're at a point in time, right? Where, you know, there might be some backlash, but even just naming like white male victimization and having a conversation around that, it would be tough. I would not want to be the one facilitating it. Right. But do you think that you could? Oh you know? yes. I've, yeah. I've done it many times and I'll, I'll continue to do it in the sphere of influence that I have. Um, but it, you know, to, to create a, a mindset in a school where everybody, number one, the adults are on the same page because even the adults aren't on the same page in terms of justice issues. So, you know, it's just, there's just a lot of different challenges. Is anyone else experiencing that or does anyone have similar? Yeah, I, I can. Go uh, ahead, Irene. Um, I completely, 100%. And, and as a woman too, like being able to ask those questions is, can be tricky. Sometimes it's better coming perhaps from my male colleagues, but um, the advocacy piece to me seems very advanced compared to where the boys are, at least our boys are right now. I think that cycle of uh, the pastoral circle that you put up at the end, that's probably the most helpful thing for me to see because I feel like our, our starting point is social analysis. Some of them have had experiences, most of them have had some kind of service experience, but but then taking that experience and, and, and unpacking it in light of the world around them is really important. And I think um, ways to have those conversations in our, in our current situation, being distance, that's kind of like where I am. Like I need, I'm, I'm looking for ways to engage them in authentic ways in a time that feels very inauthentic and apart. So that's sort of my, my curiosity and and the the white male the for that that sort of thing the armor that they wear uh, takes a long time and a lot of trust they have to trust us as adults to have those conversations with them and feel safe to to even go down that path so i feel like it's 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 not a one one and done certainly right it's a many many conversation cycle yeah yeah i i, I think am i on yeah I think one of the difficulties is that there's uh, so much anger in, a, in our society and uh, nobody seems to want to constructively deal with it. All they want to do is punish and hurt. And um, it becomes very hard um, to, but it will be, I'll tell you this, it will be very hard because um, I do think at certain points it's easier, but I think now with, the culture we, we're in right now, it's going to be very hard to try to, to deal with any of this in a, in a compassionate way when everybody, all everybody wants to do in our culture, when all the adults in our culture just want to hurt everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, the, everything that everyone is speaking is very real. Um, and I don't, again, this is a, ch a challenge for educators this time. I just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I will say some, something, and we're gonna provide more resources, um, but I, I hear that like it sometimes like, especially with high school boys, it's like the intellectual argument, right? Can really get people in kind of aggression mode or our, our debate mode. Um, and I think that that's where the, in that pastoral circle, that's really where um, the, the spiritual reflection, the faithful reflection comes in. So maybe you've had some life experience, right? Like we have a base understanding of some kind of social situation, maybe like getting students into their heart space. And I know that that's hard, um, but, but entering in through prayer and faith um, and something that will kind of be like, we're not going to argue. I just really want you to reflect on this kind of in your heart. And again, I know that's easier said mm -hmm. than done, but instead of starting with the intellectual, um, that is a gift of our faith tradition that we can kind of ground things in a a sense of faith and a sense of human dignity. Um, and, and so maybe start with their personal experience of like, 
what do you think about all of this like white supremacy white privilege stuff like where are you at with it you know and just give people the space to kind of channel that anger and then just hold a space to listen you know that might be step one i saw some other people had unmuted so if anyone else has any thoughts Hi, Mike Fitzgerald from Zagarian and Westwood. I think one of the biggest issues I always have is also the time. It's like, you know, we, we prepare kids to go on service trips, we, uh, long or short ones, but I've also found that it's very tough, and I find it I'm, it's tough for the kids to budget in the time to also have a conversation about the after effects or when they're also doing with three APs and all of that other stuff and sports and other things. And so I think that's become one of the biggest incumbents is the fact that it's trying to figure out the time to have that conversation. Um, when you already have them committed to, hey, I'm gonna go on a week long service trip to Camden, New Jersey, and we try to make most of the time there, but that after stuff, I mean, it's great sometimes we try to budget in a little bit of time, but it's also just logistically, it's the problem besides the all of the other stuff of their own sense of, you know, all the other issues, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I get that as well. Um, having worked at a Cristo Ray school, we had student, one grade was out of the building each day. So when we had a group trying to get everybody together, a disaster. Um, what I would say, I mean, and maybe you're not looking for suggestions. It's just, you're expressing your experience and it's true and it's real. Um, I would just invite everyone again to think about, well, now all we've got is time. I mean, it looks different and digital learning is different, but people aren't going to be rushing around as much as we usually are. And so how do we desire to really use this as like a sacred pause or a sacred kind of moment um, it, in our lives as educators to help students do some of that processing, even if it is from a previous experience, because they may not get to do service trips in the fall or the spring this year. One of the successes I think I, I've had in the classroom teaching ethics and morality is to use John Rawls' veil of ignorance thought experiment. And just, it, it talks about a, a baby uh, you, like if you didn't know where you were going to, who your parents were, where you're going to be born, but what are the things that you would want for, for yourself on the outside world uh, when you start talking about moving from the head to the heart? Um, there's a lot of things you would want to ensure your own health. And then when you begin to talk about that, then you realize that um, everybody wants these things and their basic human rights. And, uh, and then to begin saying, why is it not okay for some people not to have these things when you would want these things in your own life? Yeah. Um, any other thoughts, Kevin? I saw that you unmuted a while ago. Yeah, I can wait. I can wait until after you share the resources and programs. It was more of like comments and than than anything. So cool. All right. Um, so I just want to share a few uh, resources of the many that ISN um, has available to you. Um, and this is all for free. The only thing that um, I'm mentioning that costs money is education for justice, and I'll explain that. But we have a program called the Ignatian Carbon Challenge. That's what I run. Um, it's about environmental justice. Um, and so we focus on, we try to do learn, pray, act for almost every, um, every issue that we touch so that there is always some sort of action and outward kind of advocacy, um, as well as the interior prayer. Um, so the Ignatian Carbon Challenge, we have many challenges throughout the year during the season of creation, which is from September 1st to October 4th, um, Advent and Lent. Um, so last year for Lent, we did a food waste fast. So we uh, got people to commit to stop wasting food um, and we gave them tools to do that. Um, so kind of an environmental spiritual practice throughout Lent, um, as well as ways to advocate to reduce food waste um, 
in, in the structures of our schools. So some schools started composting before COVID shut things down, right? Um, the other thing that we have just started is the 21 day Ignatian racial equity challenge. Um, this will, this is an ongoing program, but our first iteration started on July 20th. You can sign up whenever you would like. Um, and it is a series of daily emails uh, about racial justice. The first week is kind of racism 101. The second week is racism in the Catholic church. And then the third week is racism in society. Um, so racism in the environment, racism in immigration, racism in criminal justice. Um, and so that will be ongoing so that you could have students sign up, their resources linked um, and ways to um, learn, pray and act on a variety of issues. Our solidarity across borders, I think, would be a really good tool for the encounter piece. Um, so this is a project that is going to be sharing stories of, of people in the process of migration or who have migrated. And so it's uh, kind of firsthand accounts of, of what that experience means um, and, and kind of the, the trials and tribulations that people face, as well as the justice issues involved. Um, we also held a digital advocacy workshop. Um, Aaron, it was back in April or May. We have a group that, similar to this and service directors were asking for something like this. Um, so that's also available online. And we actually had some schools present on how they were planning on doing digital advocacy as well. And I'll send links for this um, in a follow-up email with Ben, um, but that is also available. Uh, on the top left, that's Jose Cabrera, and he's our coworker who works on migration justice. We love zooming in with people, especially now, like in this world where we're just staring at our screens all the time. So if it'd be helpful for us to talk to your students or have a conversation with your classroom, staff members at ISN are very happy uh, to do that. We also have action alerts available on our website. Um, so we just had a recent uh, alert along with the uh, US, uh, the Jesuit conference of the US and Canada about policing reform. Um, we've also, we have, we have them on all sorts of issues. So if that's just like a really kind of low level advocacy ask that could be kind of like a gateway advocacy action, right? Um, as we're trying to get students to engage. Um, the final thing that I will share and then I'll kick it back to Aaron is I um, run our education for justice website. Some of your schools already have access to this resource. Um, and if they don't, we can explain how you can get access. But basically, it is a, a website that has a variety of uh, resources available to you as educators. So we have lesson plans, film discussion guides, book discussion guides, prayer services um, on a variety of justice topics. And we always try to follow the pastoral circle in all of our resources. So we'll always have uh, usually we'll have an act piece, a way that students can dig a little deeper um, into the analysis um, and structures. Um, we also, if you don't have a resource or you don't have an account to Education for Justice, this part of the website is free. It is a social justice calendar. So it goes throughout the entire year and has uh, just important dates uh, throughout history and, and, and recent. I think we just added John Lewis's death onto the calendar. Um, and so, you know, if you have a, if you have an account, you can click a, a date and if there are associated resources, they will pop up here. Um, but if you don't have an account, you can just kind of see what's happening. You can also use this button to add it to your Google calendar. So it can just, or, or I think Outlook as well. Um, and so you can add that in and it'll pop up on your calendar just so you can be kind of apprised of like, oh, this is happening on Tuesday and I'm teaching a lesson. Maybe we say a prayer for the bombing of Hiroshima because that's, you know, August 6th. Um, and then we just have a variety of resources. So if anybody has any questions about that, I do think one resource that I wanna point out for anyone who does have an EFJ um, account is this, oh, I'm not logged in. It's the service and the pastoral circle resource. Um, and so it actually provides the, it provides guided discussion questions about a service experience um, using the pastoral circle. And so what's really great about it is this could be like a really easy way to kind of start a conversation with students about, um, you know, 
what did I serve? Kind of doing a little bit of the analysis piece, the reflecting and the action. So if there's not time for that longer conversation, you know, if you have an account, you can print this out, you can give it to folks and then you can maybe find a time to, um, to process that a little bit more together. Um, so I will turn it back to Erin. Yeah, I just wanna take a few minutes to share with you all a few of our um, upcoming programs, which in non-pandemic times would be in-person programs, um, but naturally, like everyone else, we've transitioned um, to virtual for this year. So in October, we'll be hosting um, the Ignatian Family Teach-In for Justice, um, which um, it began in Fort Benning, Georgia, um, at um, or at the gates of the School of the Americas, and I believe it was in 2010, um, was relocated to Washington, D.C. Um, so it's a conference, um, it's the largest Catholic social justice gathering um, in the United States um, that happens um, typically in November around the um, anniversary of the Jesuit martyrs. Um, and it happens, we have programming speakers um, Saturday and Sunday, and then with the move to Washington, D.C., we added um, an advocacy day um, where attendees are able to go lobby on Capitol Hill. Um, so typically, we, we are able to gather about 2,000 people um, in D.C., primarily um, groups of students from both high schools and colleges, um, as well as um, people from other institutions or parishes. Um, sometimes we have individuals attend as well. Um, and, and this year, as I mentioned, we've um, transitioned to a virtual conference. Um, and with that, we did decide to shift the dates largely because of the changes in academic calendars um, at the higher ed level. Um, but we also extended our programming um, in conversation, especially with secondary educators, knowing that it would be especially hard to gather high school students um, for a weekend program um, when, when they're not required to be elsewhere in the world. Um, that sort of when everyone's in DC, it's the great equalizer in schedule. Um, so what we've done is um, added a high school track um, for the 19th through the 23rd, which is the Monday through Friday. Um, and also in those days, we will be hosting a professional development track. Um, so I'm going to speak specifically to the high school track um, as we've really designed it um, in hopes that it will be really accessible um, for teachers to be able to, to incorporate it in the classroom in that week. So our intention is to have um, 60 to 90 minutes of pre-recorded content that can be used on demand. Um, so that 60 to 90 minutes released each day. Um, and there's a theme for each day. Um, Monday, we'll start um, with the theme of the teach-in for the year, but also contextualizing the teach-in, um, the history of it, the history of the Jesuit martyrs um, and what the gathering is, knowing that for a lot of high school students, um, it's their first, it will be their first time encountering it. Um, Monday, we will, um, the theme will be migration. Um, so we'll really focus on that as an issue area. There will be some conversation, um, you know, about really specific policy education, but we also will um, have speakers that will share stories and, and have sort of that encounter um, portion, the storytelling portion um, of the issue. Um, Tuesday, we'll talk about ecology, Thursday, racial justice, and Friday, the theme will be moving to action. So really um, connecting that advocacy piece with, with the foundation that has been provided to the students um, in the previous four days. Um, and then the weekend, we will have, if you've attended the, the teaching in the past, very similar content with um, keynote speakers. We'll have a number of breakout sessions. Um, we also have a few tracks there as well. Um, we always have um, prayer and liturgy elements um, as part of that. And then, um, Brenna, you can go to the next slide. It's kind of a strange year for us. We'll still have advocacy pieces of the teach-in, again, with um, education around different issue areas um, and policy asks. Um, but with it being an, an election year and us having the teach-in two weeks before the election, um, our, our meetings, our, our lobbying will look a little bit different. Um, so we plan to host Ignatian Family Advocacy Month um, in early 2021, likely in February. The dates for that have yet to be determined. So we, we hope that will be a continuation for people who do attend the teach-in um, so that there is that action piece um, when, when representatives are in their offices and the, the attention is away from the election and people are engaging issues with um, 
with the administration um, after, after the election. And the next slide, Brenna. And then another annual program we have specifically for high school students is called the Arupe Leader Summit. Um, and it takes place each spring. We host it in three different locations, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and one in the Midwest. Um, and these are smaller programs. They're usually around 45 participants total. Um, we, we cap um, the, the delegation size to six, six students um, per school. So there's a lot of really great exchange um, with student leaders who are part of this program. And what we do is we look at um, the Student Leadership Challenge um, is a book, if you're not familiar with it, um, in parallel with the life of Pedro Rupe, who was um, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, who really turned the focus of society um, to social justice and um, faith-based justice. Um, so there are a lot of projects um, and student initiatives that have come out of this program. Um, there's a lot of really great exchange, I think, in hearing you all sort of talk about um, sort of the challenges in entering conversations with students. Something that I've witnessed um, in this program especially is that students are able to start these conversations themselves because they're interacting with people from different backgrounds and who have different perspectives and maybe their schools are approaching service or advocacy from different ways. So it's been, um, it's been a really cool program for me to witness um, and really fruitful things have come from it. Um, all of that said, um, we're not certain at this point what um, Arupe 2021 is going to look like because I don't anticipate that it will be happening um, in person. So uh, we'll keep you posted. Um, we intend to have something in its place, but um, in 2022, I, I anticipate that that will be up and running in person again. Aaron, quick question for uh, Rupe uh, Leadership Summit. Is there still a professional development element for the chaperones? Yeah, that's a great question. There are, um, if I'm not mistaken, two professional development sessions. So when the students um, have a, a presenter, um, there's a separate session run simultaneously. Um, and that too has been a really fruitful place, um, similar to the way that students have been able to exchange their experience in their schools. Um, I've seen a lot of similar things with educators too, um, and, and really great relationships come out of that summit, both on the student end um, and among colleagues um, working in similar positions across the network. Um, and we also do encourage that those schools keep in contact um, um, as they move forward with their initiatives too, that they may be taking home. Yeah, and so uh, I, we're kind of at the end of our time. I did just want to leave this quote up as we kind of wrap up because you all have kind of a huge task ahead of you as educators. You always do specifically in this moment um, more, more than probably ever before. Um, but this quote from Henry Nowen just talks about how we don't get to choose the time that we live in, um, in the line before he talks about like being alive during the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, but the idea that, that we don't choose that, but really engaging in the issues of our times allows us to, um, to experience conversion of heart and movement towards God um, and can really allow us to express our vocation in unique ways um, instead of it feeling like a burden like oh I have to do this digital classroom now or like now I'm gonna have to do this mixed classroom or we're going back in the classroom and I know someone's gonna get COVID and then we're gonna be you know I think we can spiral um, but I really hope that that you can um, find a spiritual kind of place to, to feel like this is a time where you can um, express your vocation, experience the conversion of heart, and that will deepen kind of our compassion and solidarity um, with students and, and with the people um, for whom and with we are working for justice. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Brenna. Thank you, Erin. Uh, I want to respect people's time. So if you have to log off, please feel free to do so. Um, but I'm happy to stick around um, and uh, help answer any questions. Uh, I don't know if Aaron and Brenna's schedule, but um, if they need to leave, I can certainly pass those on to them as well. I can hang out for a few minutes. So Brenna, I, I just had a quick question. Actually, this is probably for both Aaron and Brenna, probably more so Aaron. Um, the Ignatian, fa the family teaching for justice, right? So that's, that's going to be on a on a totally digital platform, right? So um, 
there will be like specific times that that we as like a class tune in are they going to be during like a normal school day or yeah that's a great question so actually with the um high school content get up is so that it's released daily um but it's intended for you to engage on demand, knowing that there's okay, no way perfect. we could work across timelines and school schedules. Another thing I should have mentioned too is that um, the platform that we'll use it, we're using, each person will have their own login, but they can access that through June 1st of 2021. Um, so either as individuals or even you know as school communities, that could mean you could engage that content throughout the year. Um, um, even if you decided to sort of use the high school track that will be released during the week um, in that week, anything that happens on the weekend, again, we'll have four keynote speakers and 20 breakout sessions. Um, you could return to those throughout the year um, between then and June and, and revisit those in your own okay. time too. Cool. That, so, that, so you didn't necessarily have to be there like if we, if we have some kind of conflict with um, like for the 19th to the 23rd of October, we can access this information in another time. Yep, exactly. Uh, and because the reason I, I asked, I think it's, so I was, I was going to, what I was going to mention was that, you know, our service programming is like a little all over the place, but the staple of, of what Good Council has been doing has been their El Salvador trip, specifically working with Fiat, um, down there um but i think you know this and and the ignatian family teaching that like is surrounding right the the jesuit martyrs i think i think we do a decent job of um of briefing them ahead of time and educating them ahead of time but this added resource i think is only going to deepen that and and maybe maybe returning to it post trip because i i know we don't do a good job of um reevaluating the kids they like go on a trip they they talk about how changed they are for two weeks and then they're back to doing what they normally do um and so i think there's there's a level of intentionality that doesn't exist here i think there's a lot of charity and then we pat ourselves on the back and then we don't ever move to the justice part um which i you know working at st john's um where eileen works and renju was on the on the call earlier i, I think we do a better job using the rhetoric and briefing and debriefing the kids pre and post service but again dealing with an all male predominantly white school up there and now i'm dealing with a 51 percent non-white school down here i think it's even more paramount and important to, to be able to like fuse both together so th this i you know that's a long way of just saying it i'm very appreciative of, of these resources so good I had a couple questions. One, can we have access to the PowerPoint that you showed us today? Um, and the second is, you know, because of the service program changing more towards the social justice wing and less towards the actual service at St. X, um, I, I, I'm curious to see what you have developed with the Catholic social teaching. Yeah, we, I mean, we have a lot of resources on the ISN website, um, but also that that is the, I'm not sure if your school has an Education for Justice subscription, um, but th that is the purpose, the entire purpose of the website is to talk about justice issues in conversation with Catholic social teaching. And we always, like I said, try to have some piece of social analysis um in an article about racism or about immigration um or just sharing kind of a personal perspective um so it's it's very it's a rich kind of library that you can dig into and we're one of the first resources we're gonna try to share with people and i'll try to share it with this group um, for free just because i think everybody needs it is kind of a list of service and advocacy ideas for the digital world so we have kind of a longer um, list so I'll, I'll get that to Ben once we have that together the just last question is uh, in regards to educational justice like account uh, would all the teachers have access to it or, or how does that work 
Yeah, so there are different membership levels. So you can get an organizational membership and that means everybody who wants access can have access. Or if you know it's just gonna be like the theology department or, um, or like campus ministry, you can get like a two to six person account. So, and the prices vary just depending on how many, or you can get an individual account. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. And is there a way to see like if you were to look it up on on the your network is there a way to see that like st john's high school is on there like or do we have to go like do i need to i need to ask people in our ad administration to find out if we're in there or what <laughs> i could um if 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 ben if you give me kind of the like the ending of the email address of every school present here, it'll be really easy for me to search and see if somebody from your school has an account and I can let you know. We can send that out in the follow-up email as well. Make sure you do that, Ben, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll try to remember, Kevin, thank you. You guys don't give each other a break, do ya? It's part of our friendship. It's been a long quarantine. <laughs> All right, folks, anything else? I just want to say thanks again and thanks for the work that you're doing and for trying to have those conversations. You know, it's always that thing of like a lot of students, like you said, Eileen probably aren't there, but there are like the one or two who get it. And sometimes that's enough. And, and like Aaron said, sometimes when you just let the students ask the questions, they also, by the grace of God, arrive there, you know, on their own. Agreed. I think, you know, for us, you know, Mike, you brought up the question about time and uh, I know Brenna certainly addressed that. I think that the long road of Catholic education, you know, at one point taking students out of school time to do service work was a really dramatic thing, right? And then that's kind of become a norm. And then as many of our schools have international service trips in hopes of increasing global mindedness and awareness of their brothers and sisters that are different than themselves, you know, that, that was radical and, and challenging. Um, but that has become norm in many of our institutions. And I think that this is that next evolution uh, in Catholic education, um, that it's not gonna be solved in a day, it's not gonna be solved uh, this year, but I think that this is that next step. I think, I think you know, we're seeing that in our youth more than ever. I think in the past several years of, of youth being the voice that many of the folks in my generation and older uh, didn't have the courage to say, didn't have the skill set to say, um, and speak up, but, the, but they're finding that. I think that we know we need to continue to grow and help support them and is very grateful for Brenna and Aaron and for their efforts and for being willing to reach across the aisle uh, from the Jesuits to the Zavarians uh, to support us um, and just so incredibly grateful for their time. So we'll be in touch with the, these resources. Uh, I'll also um, be sharing a recording of this video if you need to go back to something and if there's anything else that I can do to connect you to Education for Justice or Ignatian Solidarity Network, please let me know. Um, I, I cannot speak more highly of, of the programming. I think the teaching is an incredible experience for students, uh, especially in this digital time, but if you can ever go in person, it's one of the more moving spiritual experiences uh, I've had in my faith life. Wonderful, well, uh,